Hey folks, Veet here. Just jumping in here before the episode to let you know that we are reachable by email at inonesken at gmail.com. Or one word, no apostrophes, I-N-O-N-E-S-K-E-N at gmail.com. Also, you can find us on social media. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Just search for In One's Ken. So if you want to reach out to us, leave us feedback, have a question, or even make a show suggestion, you can find us and we would love to hear from you. Remember, you can find our show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio, and for our US and Canadian listeners on Google Play Music. And lastly, you can also find us on YouTube. Plenty of ways to find us and listen to our shows, folks. Speaking of shows, on with this one. My, my, here come the fuss. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 20-something of In One's <laughs> You, want to know you guys can actually hear me now. <laughs> yes, we can. Two zero nine. Two zero nine. Two zero nine. nine. Yes. <laughs> Look, the store that I work in, I have to memorize so many numbers that if I memorized the episode, I would forget what avocados were. They're three, two, by the way. They're three. Okay. Yeah. Not three two, not two zero nine. Avocado. There is no two zero nine. Uh, okay. Like you five, a, it's a different system than because, like, for me, it was always like there was a four and then three digits. You had to know, yeah, like 5209, I think, is strawberries or something. Oh man, so how have you guys been, Vete? How are you doing? I'm good, mate. Uh, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll specify, uh, two parts. So, my, my pop cultural, um, experience for since we last talked i went to see the guy ritchie uh king arthur movie now <laughs> i'll say two things three things it was fine enjoyable no problem second thing is it was very guy ritchie for a sort of medieval story it was very guy ritchie and third now the story of King Arthur is sort of legendary. It's set in a world of fantasy. And this, was, and this was, to say, phantasmagorical. It just sort of like pushed the boundaries a bit. But that's okay. Like I said, it was very Guy Ritchie. Uh, Claire and I went out on a date Sunday night and it was fine. We enjoyed it. It was some of the, the humor was good. Very, very, very dry, very British and very dry. Um, that was good. The other, uh, pop cultural thing is I've started watching The Expanse. Have either of you two seen The Expanse at all? I know of it. No of it. Negative. No? Um, great. I've watched the first six episodes. I love it dearly. Um, the, the effects makes you believe that they're in space. All that is done right. What I really like about it and the reason why I started watching this show is it was described to me as this. Star Trek, which we've talked about on this, sh- on this show and we love dearly, presents a f- an ideal future, a time in the future where everything is done right. Humanity is see, does see sense. It um, it goes about things the right way. It's very humanitarian. Um, there's no um, sort of gender politics. There's no racial politics. It's there's politics, but there all the other things that sort of make sort of our everyday life a bit sort of tedious and difficult um, are gone. That's taken care of. Well, Expanse is a future that is probably what it's going to be like. There's racial politics. There's gender politics. There's, you know, the um, the whole sort of what's mine, what's yours. Um, and they've done it really well. 
there's basically three Earth existences. There's planet Earth, there's the Earth colony on Mars, and there's the Earth Earth people who have settled on the, the uh, asteroid belt, which is basically where humanity is mining the resources it needs to survive. And so you've got three existences and the politics that goes on with that. And I've just, I've just really loved it. I really recommend people watch The Expanse. Then there's what's happening in my real life. I and mean, this is what's happening. So we all know since we last talked that I've applied for a job. To fill you in on where I left off, I was waiting to hear on an interview. So I got my time for an interview. I got a call from the nurse manager to say, this was on the Monday, to say that the interview would be on the Friday. No problem. Prep myself for the interview. Friday morning came along. Got all snazzied up in my suit and ready to go with my notes. And just as I'm about to head out the door, the nurse manager calls me and says they have had to postpone the interview because uh, one of the three of, on the panel, the the, the doctor, uh, was still stuck in Samoa and wasn't going to be there. And they'd have to reschedule. I said, fine. Monday comes along and she sends me an email saying, we've rescheduled your uh, appointment for Thursday morning. And I look at my work schedule, I'm going... That's immediately after a night shift. So I emailed her back and said, is there any way we can reschedule this to a different time? Um, I would literally be walking off a night shift straight into a job interview. And I didn't hear anything and I didn't hear anything and I didn't hear anything and I'm starting to fret. I'm asking around crazily at work to see if there's anybody who could possibly swap the shift. And of course... In those sorts of situations, nobody can. And then at, at sort of like late Tuesday, she contacts me and says, we can bring it forward to Wednesday. I said, that's fine. Let's do it. So Wednesday comes along. As I said, I get all snazzied up. I take my notes. I go off for the interview. Well, the three-person panel is only a two-person panel because the doctor couldn't make it anyway. And they said, stuff it. Go for it. I had the interview. It was a, in my opinion, the interview went very, very well. Um, I had a job interview for a promotion about 12 months ago, and I think this went better than that. And you know when you have sort of a, an interview or a situation like this where you walk away at the end and you replay it through your head and you sort of think of all the things you could have said differently or things you shouldn't have said, that I had none of that. It went well. And I walked away knowing if I don't get this job, it wasn't because of the interview. Well, it's been two weeks since the interview and I still haven't heard anything. As far as I know, there are three people who are vying for the job. Um, and it's basically a two-horse race, myself and somebody else. And it's been two weeks. And oh my God, the politics that goes around. Now, I'm... I've sort of hinted out here that I'm a little oblivious to the people around me and to what's going on around me from individuals. The other person I'm in this race with is, well, people are not keen. I'll put it this way. They're not keen for him to have the job, but there are others who are. So it's this sort of battle to decide whether they give this guy the job or not. And I'm finding out things about this guy that I had no idea. Like, I was completely oblivious. Because I'm sitting there going, oh, well, if he gets it, that'll be fine. I think he, he you know, deserves it in his own way. We can all sort of progress and move on. And there's this sort of, I, as I understand, uh, a real uncertainty in deciding who should get the job. I've, I've had enough. Like... I am just living day to day, waiting for this call to say yay or nay. And at, the, at this moment, I'm going, just call me and say I haven't got the job. That's fine. I just, I hate not knowing. I hate just, just tell me. I, I, I you know, I, I, if I don't get it, yes, I'll be upset. 
Um, yes, I'll be disappointed, but I'll get over that. It's just this limbo that's just driving me. Schrodinger's absolutely. anxiety. Oh, the anxiety. It's just driving me insane. And like, I'm literally wake up every morning and I'm going, I'm looking at my phone going, oh no, the mute is off. So she calls, I will hear it. I check my emails because occasionally she misses, messages me through an email. And it, it's just like, I was supposed to find out last Friday. So what's that? Four or five days ago, she sends me an email going, well, you interviewed very well, but we decided to check on everybody's references because we want to make a informed decision. And it's now Wednesday for me, Thursday for me, I should say. It's just, please, just get it over and done with. I'm expecting, look, if I vanish at any point during this episode, it's because I got a phone call, okay? I'm gone. But I, I expect some time tomorrow afternoon. That, that's me. That's, that's me. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm exhausted, emotionally exhausted. Please put me out of my misery. You went to go see King Arthur? <laughs> we got cheap tickets hey <laughs> and it was a sunday night and claire and i going what shall we do and we, we well that's where it was yeah you're one of the few people in the world <laughs> that's quite possible actually they were surprised how many people there were in the cinemas it, it probably did better here than anywhere else because there's actually absolutely nothing else on to see it might well it might be i mean um because like like when you're telling me it's like you know it's Guy Ritchie and all this stuff it's like yeah I knew this and that's why I was just kind of like I, I think I'll stay away from this it just doesn't seem like a good fit and then I find out later Dave spent like over two hundred million dollars making this thing oh, it was supposed yeah. to, it was supposed to be the start of like a whole franchise and all this stuff and it has just bombed so hard oh it has bombed hard but the you see where the money was spent in the the um, special effects and all the costuming and all that it, the money was there. And so it was the cast, really. It was a big cast. So, yeah, they spent a lot of money. It was probably about 30 people in that cinema. But it, um, there was nothing else on that night, and Clint and I wanted to do something. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, I liked Guy Ritchie's Sherlock Holmes movies, but that's kind of about it. Hmm. Yeah. No, um, I, I've gone to see a movie that's actually faring quite similarly, but it had about half the budget, and that's Alien Covenant. How um, was that? I liked it. It's a pretty solid film. Um, it has it has a problem that I have where a lot of Hollywood, um, they've got point A and they've got point B, but they can't figure out how to get the characters to go from point A to point B. So they have the characters become really stupid between points A and B just to make the plot happen. Um, so the movie does that. Um Basically, a lot of the problems in this film would have been avoided if, when landing on a brand new, unexplored world, you don protective gear. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's got breathable atmosphere. We're good. Oh, that's all We're that good. matters. Let's We're go. Done. No, no yeah, pretty much. kind of bacteria or anything. No, that doesn't no. matter. No, it's got no. breathable atmosphere. Go. Yeah, yep. exa exactly. Exactly. And um, like the Spaniards of yore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, only, you know, planetary-wide levels. No, it, I mean, once you get past that, though, I actually um, really liked it. I, I thought the story was pretty decent. Um, it does some interesting things. It is, in its own way, um, explaining some things that have been curious with the Alien in the original series um, and adding some new kinks and twists to the established lore, if you will. And I'm falling on the edge of the sword that is okay with it um i know there's a lot of people who are losing their damned minds out there with what they're learning in this film uh i don't think it's that big a deal it actually makes an awful lot of sense if you think about it um and there's still answers well there's still questions i should say that uh, have yet to be answered so there's planned on like two movies that should help fill in some of these gaps that are still existent. But I have faith in it. I think it's pretty fun. Uh, gore, gory movie, <laughs> exceedingly gory movie. Um, again, though, I'm not, I'm not phased by that, but damn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, um, if there's like two people listening to this podcast that actually are aware of this controversy and care, no, they are not retconning the alien queen out of existence. Calm down. 
Just <laughs> calm down. No, ser- seriously, I've been watching the internet. The internet is like, I-, I swear, the echo chamber is amazing. Like two or three people who are idiots come to the wrong conclusion and just start screaming at the top of their lungs. The internet goes, oh God, and just starts following along wisdom without ever once applying critical thought to the situation. Where would you put it in the scheme of all the other alien movies? Oh, it's easily the third best of the entire franchise. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection are way worse than this. Um, oh, man. Well, it's true, man. There's like a, there's a serious drop in quality. And what's what's sad about that is like, I don't I don't dislike 3 and 4 as much as some people do. You know, I think they're acceptable. But they're not nearly in the same league as 1 and 2. Not even close. Um, this movie's much better than Alien 3 and Resurrection. And where does it fall in the timeline? Um... We're we're still before Alien. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, it's all it's all prequel stuff. Um, right, okay. There was Pro, there was Prometheus. Um, yeah, there was Prometheus, and then this movie takes place right after it. And even though it's called Alien in the title, it functions much more like a direct sequel to Prometheus. Um, okay. It, however, also has very direct ties to the alien series as well the alien also makes an appearance it's in the posters it's not a spoiler um you know so it it is very much clearly an alien movie but it's still carrying through as the themes and the questions of prometheus okay so it's it yeah it's kind of like a weird hybrid kind of thing like the movie doesn't really know what it wants to be but it still puts it all together in a very satisfying package i felt yeah Um, that that's what i heard that it was trying to like it was trying to be two different movies. Yes, it wants it wants to be two different things. Right. Um, okay. I think it's successful at that, but it, it clear, it's it's pretty clear that it, it's trying to be two think, two things at once. Yeah, I'm. I liked it. I thought it was great. Like I said, there's a few things where people just they're they're so dumb, and then they cause dumb things to happen, and you're like, oh gosh. But past that, it was good. Um, there is absolutely no hope in that film. By the way, if you're going for something that's uplifting and enjoyable, don't don't go to that movie. There is no hope in that movie. It is one of the darkest things I've ever seen. Also, m- random religious sim- symbolism. Yeah, but that was also true in Prometheus. Prometheus was just all over the place with the religious symbolism. Um, other than that, I've been... Um, actually writing that book i've been threading to write for quite a while like seriously writing it i've i know well i've spent i've spent the last um gosh uh, just to show you like some of my 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 work process here um i've spent the last year and a half uh putting together backgrounds and timelines and uh information about the setting and yada 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 and i've spent the last uh week or so now writing it pretty pretty aggressively uh haven't really been doing much else i've you know other than going to work and rating when i have to um but yeah right now i'm at like uh, 27 pages it's like almost sixteen thousand words right now um which means that i'm almost one tenth of the way through to my target lengths I'm looking to have have something be about two hundred thousand words. Okay, cool. Well, it's just I did I did some research and I was finding uh that like a lot of the books that I've liked, like the ones that I felt had a good story and had plenty of information, but not too much information, and so on and so forth, um, were somewhere in the range of about two hundred thousand to two hundred and twenty thousand words. So I'm not I'm not like holding myself to it, but that's kind of like the target range. I'm gonna see if I can get to about there i think that would be acceptable um the other thing and the reason why i'm bringing this up um the other thing that i've known for years because a couple of my favorite authors do this um sanderson especially and jim butcher um they have what they call alpha readers which essentially is after there's like a a rough draft or a second draft they put it together and they go okay someone else needs to look at this and they just throw it at people and they're like, please, please read this and then tell me in every way how much it sucks. Like, if you don't like something that a character said, if you feel something's out of place, if you, this didn't make sense to you, if you don't like the pacing of this, if you think I spend too much time on that, whatever, just tell me, you know, yell at me about it. And then they do the 
the final beta version of it before they try to publish it. So yeah, you guys are on that short list if you want. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then you can totally yell at me about shit. It'd be fun. But that's pretty much all I've been doing though. Like I can't, I can't really talk about that because I'm not going to spoil my own book. That's about it. My turn. No, we're just going to okay. skip here and continue. Okay. So you don't want to know that I'm, I may possibly become a manager. Go no, on. I'm not interested in that at all. I am. So yeah. I'm kidding. So yeah, this past uh, week has been kind of crazy. <clears throat> um, it all started with me sitting at lunch at the same time as one of my managers, and she gets a phone call. And she's like, oh, man, that was about an interview. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool interview. That's that's cool. Good luck on that. And then I come to work like the next day and my other manager's like, hey, your other manager just put in a two week notice. <laughs> <laughs> the one from the day previous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I was like, uh, why are you telling me this? And she's like, well, if there was anything you wanted, do you have any questions about shift management? Now's the time to ask. And I was like, what is it? What do you, what, it, what, what? And I'm like, okay. Wait, so what you're uh, saying is that you can make it so that you can show up to the raids on time? Yeah, no, no, that's still <laughs> magic. He, he makes the schedule. And then, uh, so like, I'm like, okay, I get, what are you trying to, you know, what are you trying to tell me? And uh, my manager was like, well, we're going to need a new shift manager. And the store manager already has someone in mind, but it wouldn't hurt to, like, prepare. I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, probably somebody who's been at the store longer than me. And she goes, that doesn't mean they know anything. Just if you need to know anything, you can ask questions. And I'm like, okay. And then I'm sitting at lunch uh, yesterday. And the store manager comes in. He's like, yeah, you may have already heard, but uh, yeah, the manager, she's leaving. I uh, just want to let you know that uh, our new district manager is going to come in and, uh, you know, do an, do an interview with you. Um, oh, and, and anybody else who's interested. And uh, so uh, if there's any questions or anything, just, you know, you can ask. And I'm like, wait, what? Is this like a thing? Is there a chance I could be manager? So apparently it's a possibility and everyone knows it, but me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's cool. So yeah, that, that's kind of cool. Like, well, it's kind of not cool because I do like the manager that's leaving, but right. I told her, I was like, I was like straight up, why are you leaving? Like, did the company do anything to upset you or anything? She goes, no, I hate customer service. And I was no. like, Oh, that's go. easy for me. <laughs> like I don't have a problem telling somebody where the potatoes are. Like, how does that ruin your day? So yeah, that's what's going on. Oh man, but it does mean that I'm like working harder. Like this is it. It won't date the episode, but say last night I had a shift and I stayed way too late to help, and then had to come home. I got home at eleven o'clock at night had to immediately go to sleep to wake up to go do a morning shift. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, oh, God, am I sure I want this? Mm. But he did say that he's going to be working on uh, giving us all rotating weekends. So that that was the best news I heard. Yeah. It's like possibility of becoming a manager? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Rotating weekends? Yes. I'm on board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, on the, on the pop culture front, though, I think Guardians of the Galaxy infected me. So good, like I I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> like I've seen it twice. I bought Fleetwood Mac's Rumors tonight and was listening to Chain on the way home. Like I just bought the Volume Two mix. I I think it's my favorite movie right now. Honestly, like I'm just waiting for it to come out on Blu-ray so that I can put it on and have it playing nonstop on repeat. I just want to watch it over and over and over. It's so good. Yeah, wow. that's about it. 
I like it. I, I, I think that movie's pretty pretty spectacular. And one of the, just to kind of like add to it, one of the things that I actually really appreciate about that film is it doesn't fit that mold that they keep reusing over and over with the other Marvel movies. Like, it, it, it very much is its own thing and doesn't give a crap what you think about it. Yeah. And I, I think that helps. I really do think that helps. I would agree. Yep. <clears throat> it is very... It does have a very different feel to the other MCU movies. Speaking of Marvel, let's get to the topic, which is a director who left the 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 seat of directing a, uh, Ant-Man. Straight up walked out. Edgar Wright. <laughs> so uh, Edgar Wright is a writer, director, kind of not really an actor, who has directed one of my favorite television shows, one of my favorite trilogies, one of my favorite graphic novel adaptations, and my favorite one-second-long shot, a, directed a single shot of Star Trek Into Darkness. <laughs> okay. One no joke. Second. One second. One second long shot in Star Trek Into Darkness. Okay. And I can, without hesitation, say it's my favorite scene in that movie. So, like, you've if, if you've uh, listened to any of our other episodes, you've probably mentioned me and my secret love affair with Edgar Wright. Like, he's the best. For me, personally, I love Edgar Wright. Because Edgar Wright is a director who is... He's the best director that makes productions where he's a fan of things. He's like the best fandom director. If you like Stephen King and... um. Sam Raimi and goofy horror and sci-fi. Edgar Wright is your man in Hollywood because he's a fan of that and he will use that to pay homage to all of that great stuff and do it in a wonderful way, in a deconstructive way, and completely separates himself from the majority of Hollywood who just do standard shots and, like, base, like bachelor degree composition of shot reverse shot boring crap v did you get to watch any Edgar Wright stuff um i only had a chance to watch hot fuzz so yes you're doesn't good. matter you're, you're good. totally good <laughs> you you got the full Edgar Wright yeah so the first time i encountered Edgar Wright was with a not widely known television show called Spaced. Spaced puts Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, and Edgar Wright together. Like, they had worked on Asylum, which was a short, uh, dark humor comedy television show for the BBC. And Simon Pegg was getting ready to do a sitcom for Channel 4. And he was like, hey, I met Edgar Wright. He's a cool guy. Let's ask him to direct. Best decision ever. Spaced is an amazing slice of late 90s pop culture and comedy. To the point that there is an episode where Simon Pegg and Nick Frost buy cheap acid at a bar... Simon Pegg trips on acid and plays Resident Evil 2 for 24 hours straight, and reality begins to meld. <laughs> like, he'll, his friends will say something, he'll look at them, and they'll look like zombies, and he'll freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Nick Frost, who is a militant anarchist, <laughs> is in all camouflage running circles in the park around a single tree. It is brilliant. It is hilarious. It is everything that you would see in a modern Edgar Wright production, just 
in the, in the late nineties. It's brilliant. Um, Edgar Wright is completely my favorite because he does something most directors do not do. You've heard me pray Sam Raimi about it, how his, his uh, camera is almost another character. Edgar Wright's camera is so well done in its use of composition. It, so many times, you, would, you don't even notice it when you're watching it, but the camera is setting up the gags or the jokes. Um, like in Hot Fuzz, Things enter the frame in funny manner. So you have a close-up of Simon Pegg, and he's trying to say something serious. Someone shoves a piece of pie in his face from off screen, and he's still trying to talk, and he looks at the keg. He's like, no, thank you. Like, the camera is setting up that gag, and you don't even realize it. Or in the same movie, Hot Fuzz, Nick Frost leaving the scene in funny ways. Standing in the rain, he's telling Simon Pegg off, and then he has to turn, and he has to waddle away on a long shot away from Simon Pegg. And it's just like, he's like, just like, we're not friends anymore, and he turns around, and he waddles away in the rain. Hilarious. The camera is setting up all those jokes. Like, time and time again, he does it. In Shaun of the Dead, it's like, are they still out there? Nick Frost turns around. Pulls the blinds aside. There's zombies at the window. He closes the blinds slowly. Turns back around. This is a single shot. Turns back around to where he was standing previously and goes, yes, they're still out there. Brilliant comedy. That other people ignore the camera for. That is the one thing I hate about a modern American comedy. It's like, oh, we got to cast a comedian and he has to just say some... You're like ass or fart joke. It's not funny. Like you just do something stupid. You hit somebody with something. You're like, it's just garbage. It's just utter garbage. There's no composition techniques. There is nothing. It's like point the camera. All right, say something funny or do something funny. All right, next shot. Like that's that's one of the reasons why I I can't stand. Like I don't even want to watch that new Ghostbusters because it's people ad libbing. <laughs> like that's the composition. It's like, hey, uh, we got a scene. There's a hearse. Say something funny about the hearse. There's no forethought. There's no comedic timing to it. Edgar Wright does things that other people don't even consider. He uses jump cuts as comedy. Like in Scott Pilgrim, there is a scene. Where the main character is laying on a bed next to his friend. His friend is passed out because he's drunk. He lays down. The main character is looking at the ceiling. Jump cut. It's morning time. The main character is gone. Jump cuts. He uses jump cuts artistically. There's a scene in Scott Pilgrim where the character zones out. You know when people zone out, they kind of ignore everything around him. The shot focuses on the main character. What? Huh? <laughs> Did you zone out? There, there's a shot where the main character is focused on, the world kind of dims around him, and you see him moving throughout his day, and then one of his friends yells at him, and he like wakes up, and he's walking in a completely different location at a completely different time of day. It's a jump cut. Like It's hilarious. It's like, man, he was so zoned out, he went through an entire day without realizing what was going on. It's brilliant. I love Edgar Wright. Like, I freaking love him. He, he did Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and World's End. He's aided also by being British, in my opinion. Yeah, the Brits are pretty fantastic. Well, the, the, they have a very different sense of yes. humor. Um, as, you, as you pointed out, um, a lot of American comedy is um, something I don't appreciate. I don't, I don't find, even, even when a lot of it is actually written that way, it's like the writer is going, hey, you know what would be really funny? If this guy threw up now, and it's like, it's not funny. You, I mean, just because you put a bunch of people in a very weird and awkward situation that would never occur in real life doesn't make it funny. Sometimes I'm just like, this is dumb. Who thought this up? Um, he, on the other hand, um, in like this typical sort of British way, will point to common everyday events 
and derive humor from them. Um, my personal favorite, um, and I, I, this is one of the reasons why I love, I want everyone to watch Shaun of the Dead, like genuinely, truly. There's red on you. It is the most hilarious line ever because you've got to think the guy, his pen is leaking. He's got this giant blotch of red on him. He knows it's there. It's like two thirds of the way through the day. And then you're like, Hey, you've got red on you. Like no one else has pointed this out to him. Really? Yep. And it's, you used really as a think callback. you're the first person. And it's also a callback reference. Once he gets blood on him. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got red on you. Oh, Oh yeah. And it's at that point, it's it's blood covering his entire shirt instead of just one spot. It's like, hey, you got red on you. Like, yeah. Well, as go was, and the movie also opens with just all of them around a table at a bar having a conversation. And the conversation is just, oh, my God, am I really watching this conversation? You know, and that, that's how the characters who are there also feel. They're like, this conversation is happening? Really? And then you're watching it going, yes, yes, people actually do act that way. Oh my god. Yeah, he he also uses sound. Timing sound with comedy. When was the last time you've seen somebody use comedy that's not a fart in a movie to to be the, you know, the point of a joke? Shaun of the Dead, when they first see the zombies, they're standing there in shock that there's a hole in someone's gut that you can see all the way through. You can see the daylight through them. They're standing there in shock. Simon Pegg is like a gasp. And then you hear, and Nick Frost pulls a Kodak camera up into view like he's about to take a picture. And Simon Pegg looks down and slaps the camera out of his hand. Like, when is the last time you've seen someone use sound as comedy? Like, it's amazing. There's no words in the scene. It's just shock. Sound of someone winding a camera. Look down, slap it away. Simple. Beautiful. And he also... It really doesn't come across unless you watch it. Yeah. Like, like we can describe all of these things, and it's just kind of like, we can't do it justice. you got to see it. Yeah. Like, honestly, the visual... He's so visual that it's... Any other film that says comedy... I can describe any of the scene like because all all it's all driven by the line anchor man. I'm in a glass case of emotion. He's standing in a telephone booth crying. That's the scene. The only thing that makes a comedy is the delivery. Whereas you watch a Shaun of the dead. They're in a bar beating zombies with pool cues to the beat of a queen song. It's synchronized. And then, and then Simon Pegg turns to Nick Frost and goes, kill the queen. What? The jukebox. Yeah. <laughs> like amped up to 11 because they're British. Yeah. Fantastic. There, and there's other things like not just comedy, but drama. There are times when like, uh, a scene from Shaun of the Dead. Simon Pegg standing there with a knife, holding it up beside his face. When he gets the idea to use the knife, he moves it slightly and causes it to lens flare at the camera, and then he looks at it. So that you can tell the idea he just got from the visual cue of the lens flare that he caused. No words. Again, no words. Just, what are we going to do? tilts the knife lens flare looks at it like gives it a side glance it's like bam you got everything you need to know he didn't have to do any kind of delivery with with dialogue at all just composition just how he puts the camera in a place where it fulfills all the missing space for the scene brilliant and then he does fun stuff that I always love from Sam Raimi, where he does the quick, the uh, the quick zoom montages, where like if somebody's getting ready in the morning, it's like quick zoom on the the toothbrush, quick zoom on the shaver, like him holding up the shaver all menacingly, like, turning it on, like that kind of stuff, where he's paying homage to horror films and Sam Raimi, like Shaun of the Dead has the recurring gag of like 
the medicine cabinet slightly ajar and Simon Pegg closes it. Like in a horror movie, the monster's always there. He closes it. It's like, it's his flatmate who's always like, you were up so late last night. I couldn't sleep. And then they do a callback where he closes it. And he's like, oh, he's not there. But then there's a shadow in the curtain on the shower. And it's like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I think a lot of it, too, is like, because you're talking about specifics. But, I mean, any movie can have, you know, that, that point of brilliance, right? That they're just like, oh, wow, that was phenomenal. And then the rest of the movie is just not like that. His movies are pretty consistent. Like the he, whole thing all the way through is like that. Um, and also what the movies are about are pretty sweet. I mean, they're, they're, they're just a lot of fun to watch uh, based on, you know, the, the, the setting and the characters. Um, also, you know, bless him for introducing the world on a greater scale to who Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are. You know, um, I mean, that's how I found out about them anyway. Um, and I know a lot of people in America found out about Simon Pegg and Nick Frost because of his movies, Shaun of the Dead, especially. Um, you know, I, I, I just kind of find his, his stuff is unique. I mean, Veet saw Hot Fuzz. I mean, let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, I mean, I mean, Hot, Hot Fuzz is basically you have the most amazing cop ever. He's so good that everybody hates him. It's like, this guy is just, he's like cranked up to 11. He makes us all look bad. We need to get rid of him. Over, and so they, performer. yeah. Oh, a total overperformer. So they're like, we're just going to send him to a town where nothing happens. Of course, little do they know that the town's basically home to a cult <laughs> that slaughters everyone. It's so, oh man, it's just completely messed up. It's a fantastic film. Yeah, his movies are great. And the reason I focus on his his cinematography is because it's consistent. It sets him apart from everyone. Like the scene where he goes to that town. Everybody else, any other uh, director, when you do a transition, like I'm going here, it's always just a shot of the person in a car. You show the person driving towards where they're arriving, seen. Edgar Wright's movement of a character from one location to the other is Simon Pegg sitting in one spot holding a plant. And it's just time is moving forward in jumps. Yeah, it. it's like he his positioning in the frame doesn't change. But everything around him constantly changes to show the progression of his movement to the place. And, yeah, that plant. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just straight, just holding a plant, sitting on a bench. The time is moving forward. And then you even see him startled by a train that pops in scene and is blaring its horn. And then, bam, jump cut. He's, on, he's just on the train, leaning, thousand-yard stare out the window, holding this plant. It's all he has. <laughs> like, it, it's interesting. He can take something as boring as going from one place to the next and make it visually interesting. Right. And, and I, I do appreciate that. It's, it's just like, as much as I do notice and appreciate it, I almost don't find that to be the interesting part about what he does. I mean, what, what I find interesting about the way that he does is there's there's almost no hesitation. There's no, there's no like holding back when it comes to just sudden tonal shifts. You know, Sha Shaun of the Dead, for example, is constantly funny and yet it'll kill people brutally, randomly. He'll go from cracking a joke to having a heartfelt scene with his dad and his dad turning into a zombie. And then they brutally mess up his, you know, just the whole, the whole thing is just, you know, the the emotional roller coaster of it is actually real. It's hilarious in hindsight. Um, and then you have things like Hot Fuzz, where all of a sudden it's just incredibly bloody. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. Well, you know, see, it's that's like because... a piece of a building falls on a guy, and you watch it happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's the thing about Edgar Wright is, 
like Shaun of the Dead is homage to horror. And so he breaks that down and Hot Fuzz Hot Fuzz is homage to action movies. Like to the point that um what is the movie they keep re- referencing? Point break. Point break and yes, yes. Bad Cops too, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. Bad Boys 2. Bad Boys 2, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Like, well, he's, so he, he's he a big movie guy. It, but, but I think with Hot Fuzz, he puts more of his uniqueness in there. Like, he deconstructs the plot to to move in the way of an action film, but his, his shot compositions, like, he's doing visual comedy and stuff that nobody else does, that no one understands, like... It's it's completely unique to Edgar Wright the things that he does with his composition. Well, and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that he is so well versed in filmmaking. Like he loves movies. Um, one of the things that just tells you the guy is a super geek. Like he he is such a geek. Yeah, he's basically he's one of us, if you will. Um, he does a commentary on Hot Fuzz with Quentin Tarantino. They discuss, I can't remember where I saw it, but I think the list, there's like over 200 different movies that the two of them reference in the course of this commentary. Yeah, it's That's why crazy. I said, if a fan of movies was going to make a movie, it's Edgar Wright. The man is, he's a cinephile. Yeah, and and but he's so he's so well versed in all of these different movies that he he has to have had his own ideas while watching them. I mean, I know, I know I have certain ways that I would do something if I were given the chance. These things like you mentioned, like the jump cut and stuff like that. I, you know, there, there are things that I've seen other movies do where I'm just kind of like, Oh, that was a neat idea. Why didn't they elaborate on blah, 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 blah. You know, it's just because their, their mindset's different, you know? And like, he is this, he's one of those guys who he's skilled enough and he has the opportunity to actually carry that out. And you're watching it. And it's great. And it, it's sort of like to jump around to um, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. My favorite commercial flop. <laughs> that is absolutely true. No, it's his only it's the only movie he ever made um, through through American Studios. So it's it's his only American film. It's an adaptation of a comic um, by Lee O'Malley. It's I haven't actually read i know way too much about it though um which kind of ruins the point of reading it um but scott pilgrim versus the world is one of the most bizarre things i've ever seen as a movie um not because it's bad but just wow really you did this he took an eight i think it's eight volumes but he took his he took this massive hundreds of pages of comic book condensed it into two hours and actually did it justice and it's coherent Yes. It's a slightly different ending because the ending hadn't been finished by that point. They were trying to ride that uh that commercial wave, if you will. Um but yes, it does it justice. It makes total sense. It's it's a coherent film with a beginning, a middle, and an end, character arcs, the whole thing. It's wonderfully done, and it made me feel old as shit. It was the first time ever in my life I've felt old. And it was it was bizarre because I went to this movie. I, I saw it in theaters. I was very excited about it because I like Edgar Wright. And I'm like, ooh, this should be good. Uh, and it was. It was very, very good. But it made me feel old because of the loud noises and the constant music. And I was just being inundated with every single pop culture and internet meme reference and inside joke that I fully understood. There is literally not a single joke in this movie that got under my radar. I understood it all. Even weird things like just handing the guy the skateboard. I got it. I totally get it. And I think it was that recognition of watching basically my entirety of well, basically the entirety of my generation's culture play out on screen. I was like, I'm old, <laughs> hmm. you know, I'm like not even 30 at that point, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it like, it genuinely made me feel old because like the movie is too loud. The movie is too fast. Yada, yada. I wasn't upset about any of this, but like, I was just like perceiving it that way. It was crazy. Um, wonderful film. 
I, yeah. I recommend it if, if you're I was, looking for something that's absolutely bonkers. Yeah, I was on the opposite end of the spectrum. I was like, finally, someone makes a movie that looks like my brain. <laughs> See, but that's, I think, was exactly the problem. Like, I'm like, wow, that's how I think of things. Oh, God, that's how I think of things. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know something's wrong when there's 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 a joke of telling someone to get a life, and he goes, I already have a life. He slaps an icon floating in front of him, a digital video game, like, mock 18-bit icon. It says one up. Then they do a callback where he dies at the end of the movie and then remembers, wait, I have an extra man, and yeah. comes back to life. <laughs> yeah, it hurt. It hurt in a good way, but it hurt. It's like a visual joke actually turned into plot. Yeah, and admittedly, yes, this is a lot like what the comic is, but I actually also feel that that is why he was the right man to do it. He understood. Yes. I. He, he understood. But that movie had a lot more going for it than just uh, Edgar Wright. I own the vinyl soundtrack. Great soundtrack. No, I know it's a great film. Um, but also, just because we're talking about Scott Pilgrim, Scott Pilgrim is also um, an interesting case study in marketing, hype, and expectation and results. Um, when I went to the Comic Con that year. Uh, everyone was kind of joking that it was the Scott Pilgrim Comic Con because that was all you saw. Okay, they they had Michael Sarah and his guitar with the giant pink background plastered all over the Hilton Hotel right across from the convention center. Um, they had Scott Pilgrim food trucks all over the place with the lines that said "bread make you bread makes uh, bread makes you fat." You know, just bread makes you fat. Of, yeah, it, just, <laughs> it was it was just full of Scott Pilgrim everywhere. I'm surprised Beck wasn't there playing the songs from the Sex Book. Yeah, um, there might have been speakers playing certain things, um, yeah. but yeah, it was just insanity. It was absolute insanity how much Scott Pilgrim was there, and there was so much hype coming out of Comic Con. It was like, oh, Scott Pilgrim's gonna blow away everything. Just look at all this hype coming out of Comic Con, and then the movie came out and absolutely tanked. Yep. Complete disaster. Even though nobody critics- went. Not only critics loved it, freaking other directors, Quentin Tarantino was like, that was freaking amazing. Yeah, other directors were like, I love this movie. People were like, what? Scott Pilgrim? I don't even know who that is. (laughs) What's a graphic novel? Does that mean it's like a comic book, but more violent? (laughs) It's so sad. Yeah, I mean, it it had a production budget of $60 million, and it totally failed it. Is even worse. <laughs> well, no, I mean, like the actual production budget, not the advertising or anything like that, but the actual production budget, just making the movie it was sixty million dollars, and it made forty-eight million. And that as doesn't... a comparison, the production budget for Hot Fuzz was eight million. Yes, well, it's a very special effects-ridden film. Yeah, unbelievably so. You can you can tell while you're watching Hot Fuzz that Hot Fuzz is like done on the cheap. Not that that is bad. You know, he hides it well with his cinematography and the. But you know, there there's almost nothing um, built. You know, it's all filmed on locations, and you can just tell, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, you can tell that they were making the movie pretty much cheap, on the go, guerrilla filmmaking. You know, go 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 kind of style. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, Scott Pilgrim also. Yeah, like you're great cast i mean michael Sarah runs it at kind of like the height of his popularity i don't have anything against him i think he's cool um mary elizabeth winstead is in it and i think she's wonderful um and then there's also these really random people uh chris evans is in it yeah. Captain America's Captain in it. America's brandon in ruth it. uh the earlier superman is in it <laughs> you know it's just yep it's he's like one of the boyfriends like Cap- yeah. he, scott pilgrim has to fight captain america and superman and when <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a ridiculous film. It's so much fun. Um, it's not bloody or anything. V, you totally nope. But happen. but being a lesbian apparently gives you ninja powers. Yes, totally. Okay. Just like being a vegan makes you a super psychic. And, and the then, vegan police, the vegan police will come for pun- you. Fail. Yeah, then the Punisher comes up and takes your powers. Yeah, yeah. seriously, V. It's oh god. V, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. Away. V, it will yes. destroy you. You'll be like, what am I watching? What? No. Sam will Just probably no. love it. 
<laughs> Sam will lo- probably should, love she it. She probably yeah. has already seen it. I'll have to ask her. I should have asked her. Yeah, if she hasn't, if she hasn't <laughs> seen it, then you definitely need to make this happen. Okay. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Oh goodness. Um, yeah. So I mean that that was his only American film. Um, shame that it was a bust. I, I felt that it deserved to do so much more than it did. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, and it's just then a shame. Ant Man happens. Now let me let me get into this one because I actually saw a minor part of this tragedy unfold before me with my own two eyes. Um, Scott, not not Scott Pilgrim. Um, wow, I've got uh, my brain. No, um, Edgar Wright um, had been actually working on Ant Man since before there was a Marvel Studios. He'd he'd spent almost a decade on this. Um, by the time it was actually starting to happen. He just loved Ant-Man. Ant-Man was a comic book character that he really enjoyed because as he described it on stage at the Comic-Con with me and several other thousand people watching, um, he said he was always just one of my favorites. I mean, you've got this guy who can become really small and then really big at will, and he can use that during a fight. That's got to just be visually amazing. you know. And he was just stuck, again, on that, that visual aspect of it. You know, he, he loved it. Um, he actually brought test footage to the Comic-Con that he had made. And some of that footage uh, winds up in the movie proper as um, as one of the fights during the finale. But when he's beating up these security guards, he grabs the one by the tie and throws them over him. Um, and that was in this, this test footage. Uh, the same choreography, the same layout. And he was just genuinely excited. Um seeing him there in person uh, just yapping about all these comic book stuff and Ant-Man and how great it was going to be and and how he was just finally excited to have this movie happen now like I said the, the thing though is he'd been working on this since before there was a Marvel Studios and we don't know exactly where it went wrong um, I do well, okay, if you do, then inform me when we get to that point. Um, but he he wrote, developed, designed, and started directing this film. He was very excited about. And then in the middle of it, left. He walked away from 10 years of work right wow. in the middle of it. And um, like I said, correct me if I'm wrong here, but we think it was because he didn't want the movie to integrate as heavily into the Marvel universe as they were making him do it. So what ended up happening um, was he was butting heads with Marvel. They did not like the direction he was taking the movie. They wanted to go in another direction and filming was supposed to start on like June. uh, It was June 2nd. Exactly. And he shows up to set Marvel had behind his back rewritten an entire script. And they go, here, this is what you're using. And he just went, I'm gone. Like, they, they, he literally came to work, and they went, yeah, all that stuff, it's gone. Here's the script we wrote. Wow. Hmm. And this is from someone who was, like, close to the production. Like, this was reported. Like, they came to work, and all of his... But basically, his entire work was in the garbage, and they said, "This is what you're using. You have no choice." I'd so little, yeah, I'd be a little ticked myself. That's intense. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can imagine just looking and going, "Nope." And oh, just yeah. Walk. oh yeah, I agree. Yeah, and it's it's a damn shame that that happens. Um, I I can only imagine what that film would have been like had it fully been his endeavor it's it's obvious throughout that his influence is felt throughout that movie it's pretty clear his sense of humor is present everywhere a lot of the visual sight gags are clearly derived from his you know pre-production work planning things out putting it together because you know before they even start filming this stuff with the scripts, they've been doing all kinds of work. They've been, you know, building rigs and getting sets together and developing plots and storyboarding things and 
devising how they'll build these gags and et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of his actual work is still in the film and to Marvel's credit, ironically, um, if what you said is true, and I don't have any reason to doubt that it is. I just haven't seen anything that said that. Um, if what you said is true, then it's kind of ironic that they still give him credit yeah. as one of the writers of the movie. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, yeah, and I, I just find that to be an absolute shame. Because like I said, I saw it. I was there. I saw the man excited about this movie, and he was so genuinely excited um, after having put so much time and effort into it. And I really I really feel like... Because what I'd, what I'd seen, and this might actually be, like you said, the, the rewrites, was that he didn't want the movie to be so heavily integrated into the Marvel Universe. Like, he was okay with it being so, but he didn't want to make direct allusions or have the plot be about things that would affect the universe specifically and so on and so forth and yada, yada, yada. Like, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have had Hydra in the film and things like that. Yeah, so, well, here, here's some input from Joss Whedon who read Edgar Wright's script. <laughs> He's like, I thought the script was not only the best script that Marvel had ever had, but the most Marvel script I'd read. Whedon said of the screenplay for Wright's version of the film, written by White Wright and Joe Cornish. I had no interest in Ant-Man. Then I read the script and was like, of course, this is so good. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. It's so sad. Yeah, it's a real bummer. It's a... <sighs> total, total bummer. Because I'm a big fan of Edgar Wright. And, you know, as much as I didn't really give two rats about Ant-Man before this film... Uh, I was excited about it with the test footage that I'd seen and the way that he was describing it. I was just so on board. I could see his vision. I was like, yeah, I'm right there. Totally. Let's do this. And no. Damn. (laughs) Terrible, terrible shame. Um, Especially considering um, how successful movie that they did make went on to be. Mm, Yeah. True. Yeah, and, and I still think, like I was saying, I'll, you you can just kind of see Edgar Wright in there, like a like his his fingerprints are all over it, ghost like. Yep, and and it would have been the movie that we deserve because like Wright never said anything about it, but the most appropriate thing ever he did tweet a picture of Buster Keaton, who is the king of visual comedy holding a Cornetto ice cream cone and looking dejected. And then when Joss Whedon got the Avengers, he tweeted a selfie of him looking dejected with a Cornetto ice cream, <laughs> which is a reference to uh, the Shaun of dead hot fuzz world's end. It's called yes. the Cornetto and blood trilogy. Cause there's a different flavor of Cornetto ice cream in each movie. Yeah. It's right, right. <laughs> the three, this that's the, look. yeah, the, Okay. The three movies, the three movies have nothing to do with one another, right? Except, uh, uh, except cause, that, yeah. Because I'm, because I've read, I've read the synopsis on the other two movies. I'm going, how's this a trilogy? Okay, I get it now. All right, it's a joke. It's yeah, a, it's it's a yeah. spiritual trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Nothing this man does is <laughs> is is serious. Um, you know, and speaking of the fact that he was given, um. Ant Man's writing credentials. There is another movie that he wrote, and but did not direct, and it was also kind of a bomb, not very successful in the way that they were hoping. I personally liked it for what it's worth, and that was The Adventures of Tintin. Oh yes, I like yep. that too. Yep, I thought that was great. <laughs> I mean, it's Tintin. Yes. I wasn't expecting anything better than what it was. Um, I guess other people that just wanted something different. It's not really a product of our times, to be honest. Nope. When you watch that movie, it feels like you're jumping into a different era. True. Yeah, that's yeah, fair point. Yeah, and I and I mean like a different era of storytelling, like the yeah. way that the characters interact, the way that the plot unfolds, who the characters are, et cetera, et cetera, the dog. You know, it's just it's not it's not something that would typically be made today. Yeah, I think the only movie that that does that kind of era throwback thing. It, it was, which it was very sneaky. It was Martin Scorsese's Hugo? Like you don't really know that you're, yeah. you're, you're getting, you're about to dive into a George Melier 
history lesson. <laughs> yeah, that's a good comparison. Yep. Like the history, of, you're you're watching the history of cinema play out, and you don't even realize it. He also directed one scene in Into Darkness, which I just love. Yeah. So. You know, yeah, my favorite scene. <laughs> He's all over the place. <laughs> I've got to look this up. I've got to. I've got to work out what the hell it is you're talking about. It's it's all all that Wright said was it's a scene with the Klingons and Kronos. Yeah, it's a put, single yeah. one second shot that he directed. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's he basically <laughs> did it because he was hanging around the set and Simon yeah. Pegg, who's his friend, was chilling, and then J.J. Abrams was like, "Well, you're here. You want to direct a shot?" He's like, "Really." Cool. So yeah, one second is attributed to, to Edgar Wright. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I also think that's that's important too. Is the fact that he is, you know, kind of like a collaborative partner of sorts with Simon Pegg, who seems to be in damn near everything he does. Um, you know, S- Simon Pegg is brilliant, and people should get to know him if they don't. You know, he's he's the titular character he's sean he's sergeant nicholas angel you know he's the main character in all these films um you know and he plays scotty in star trek which is pretty fantastic and he writes the movies also which i think is great um yeah so it's it's kind of like that little side thing where we get we get not only because of edgar wright you know being successful making these movies that catch on like wildfire but we also get to you know be introduced also to simon pegg you know, yeah and 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 that's been fantastic and it's been wonderful to see and also nick frost um who's always kind of not as much as simon pegg but nick he frost always plays the around. side man he does he always plays the side man even in um there's a tv show that i really like called into the badlands and nick frost just wound up in that show and he's also like the sidekick in that one too yeah yeah like he always plays the lesser character he's always the self-deprecating the lovable lovable idiot he's the friend he's the one that gets his feelings hurt he's the one that runs away like he always plays that and um there's this amazing scene in space where they're playing paintball and they straight up now this is being written by simon pegg he writes a scene where they're playing paintball nick frost gets hit and they actually do a dramatic military movie death scene where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm hit. Oh, oh God. And he's like, don't you die on me. Don't you die on me. And then Nick Frost coughs up yellow paintball paint and dies. And then it's like, all right, is the round over? Yep, let's get up. And then they get up and leave. <laughs> it's, oh, it's fantastic. So good. Thank you, Edgar Wright, for bringing them into the world. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Everything involved with them is gold. Like, it's creative. It goes against the grain of all the other schlock we have to put up with. It's people who are like, hey, maybe movies should be fun. Maybe. Just maybe. I mean, don't tell that to uh, Ridley Scott over there. But yeah, movies should be fun. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Go Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Also, um, totally got to throw out there. Um, at one point, Edgar Wright was um, dating Anna Kendrick, who he met on the set of Sky Pilgrim vs. the World. I don't actually care about this. Um, the thing that's relevant, though, is um, there was a tweet a little while ago where Wright was saying, Hey, Marvel, Anna Kendrick, Squirrel Girl. Oh my God, please. And I'm like, yes, do it. I want Squirrel Girl. Please, please make... All right. He, she can talk to squirrels. This is the best power ever. It's your one chance to make a movie where you can have Doom and it not suck. She can beat Doom. <laughs> and it not have to have anything to do with the Fantastic Four because they're dumb. Let's, let's, ex- let's explain real quick. Squirrel Girl is the character in the Marvel Universe canonically recognized as having in single combat defeated Doctor Doom, Thanos, Galactus, and pretty much anyone else you can throw into the Marvel Universe. Which she's the most ca- squirrels, she's the most yes. powerful. Yes. yes, she is the most powerful character in the Marvel Universe. This is canon. It is not a joke. Like you could literally have a movie where she's back to back just doing a boss rush of all the major Marvel villains. 
And if that wasn't the movie, I would be pissed. Just do, just straight up do a like a pagoda style boss rush. She starts off on Earth defending it from doom, and then she moves into outer space and beats Galactus <laughs> with little squirrels with little space helmets on. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. She has buck teeth, so she has the she has proportional uh, power of a squirrel, and she has a prehensile. Squ- it's just bad. It's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's my favorite comic book character that i don't take seriously okay like yeah it's like my favorite character is batman flat out because i'm on that train with everybody else okay batman is the best character ever and you're like well who is who's the next character spider-man after that squirrel girl see see my my hierarchy of superheroes goes spider-man which we get too many movies of yes magic which no one knows about Magic is amazing. She's literally kidnapped as a child and trained by Satan to do to know every magical ability in the world. Then she conquers the seventh level of hell, enslaves all the demons, and then uses that to kick ass. She is the queen of the damned. She's amazing. And she's um, Colossus's sister? Yeah, I think so. Something like that. Comics. But we'll never yeah. ever see her, ever. Nobody yeah. knows who she is. But it would well, make for the most metal Marvel movie ever made. There's too many characters, to be honest. They just need to not do things. <laughs> it's it's kind of like I I do wonder since we're kind of halfway on the topic of of the Marvel films because of his connection with Ant Man. I I actually thought when he was making Ant-Man, that Ant-Man was the first sign of the apocalypse, if you will, because I'm like, oh God, they don't know what to do anymore. They're making Ant-Man. Right. And then, you know, obviously I was totally wrong about that. Even, even with the creative differences that occurred in him leaving, I still really liked Ant-Man and I was kind of like, okay, maybe they can kind of do whatever they want outside of their big tentpole characters. All right. Um, But I, I, I just, I just feel like, you know, they're going. They're going to run out of main characters. And they're going to start being like, "We got to. We got to bring in more characters." And then they're going to make movies out of Speedball and all these other. It's going to be terrible. Nope. No. See, I know the first sign of the apocalypse is when they make the Howard the Duck film. Were you trying to make Howard the Duck, Howard the Duck, and Seth Green relevant again? That's too much. <laughs> because he's the voice of Howard the Duck in those cameos. I'm, I'm very aware of this. And what do you mean Seth Green's not relevant? Mother, he's so he's relevant. He's Leonardo. <laughs> he is so relevant. <laughs> Leonardo. And I actually accept him as Leonardo. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, after the first few episodes, he totally did fall into it. It was great. Yeah, I don't even notice it anymore. I'm just yeah, like, yep, I'm yeah, down. Seth Green's Leonardo. Hell yeah. Always got to make a Ninja Turtles reference. Yeah. So back to Edgar Wright. Um, he actually has a movie in theaters right now called Baby Driver. Yep, it comes out here June 28th. Yeah, sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Um, no, that's yeah, fine. Coming, it coming has Jamie Foxx in it. It's got like it's got like a huge cast. It's Not crazy. That racist. <laughs> oh God, no. Who else has it got? It's got Underwood. <laughs> it's got a great cast. It's got a great cast. I just, I just, I don't like Jamie Foxx. Kevin Spacey. It's got a bunch of big names in it. It does. It does. No, it looks fun. It looks fun. And like, it's funny because I'm watching the trailer. I'm watching the trailer. I'm just going, this camera movement just seems, ah, oh, it's Edgar Wright. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Kevin Spacey, Jamie Foxx. Um, who else? I don't know any of these other. Flea? Wait, John, wait, John wait. Birdsall. What? Okay. Why did you panic? D- different Flea. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I thought the musician. No. Like some dude whose name is Flea, and then there's beside his name in parentheses the letter I. I don't I don't know what this is. He's from Melbourne, so it's your fault, right. Beat. There yeah, well, I mean it it's sort of like a, I was getting I was getting the sort of pop culture Edgar Wright kind of vibes when I was watching the trailer at the theater when there was that um that scene where the guys are in the back of the car and they're yelling over the fact that he's got this mask. And, and the guy's like, you said Michael Myers. He's like, this is Michael Myers. This should be the Halloween mask. This is a Halloween mask. No, the killer dude from Halloween. Oh, you mean Jason? <laughs> yeah. 
And I'm just like, wow. Damn. You know, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's good. It's Edgar Wright. It's going to be Edgar Wright through and through. It looks ridiculous. It should be fun. It's written and directed by him. So I have faith in it. We shall see how it plays out. He actually hasn't made a lot of movies, to be honest. Um, I no, think that's one it of the is... why. I Sorry. Guess, I think that's I'm one just... of the reasons why he's successful because he, he only really, he hones all of his creativity into one thing. I mean, like one of the directors I used to really like, and now I just kind of go, Ugh, is Steven Spielberg because the man's always working on three movies at once. Yeah. And it shows, I think, frankly. Okay. So I'm still stuck on this. That flea and the baby driver, that is the basis for Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. I was not mistaken. I was like, what? <laughs> Randomly flea. Like, okay. What? Oh, all right. Yeah. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> Probably got nothing better to do with his time at the moment. It just that, <laughs> just looking at the, the cast for Baby Driver, that just hit me in the head like a brick because it's like, flea, what? Yeah, I pretty much said everything I have to say about Edgar Wright. Like, a, as a person who has an education in cinematography like i love edgar wright <laughs> like, mm. he's my favorite i will say i enjoyed the cleverness of hot fuzz um and going through his filmography i think i've seen bits and pieces of other movies i i completely agree with the the cinematography and and it sort of showed when i was talking about uh samurai jack couple episodes ago i love the ability to tell me information without the dialogue explaining it to me which is like i think robert was sort of hinting at that it, it's a, a sort of a, a common um a theme at the moment is it's it's not just in a lot of movies it's not just good enough to show me what's going on but a character has to, has to also in the dialogue explain it to me yep and it that, is that is the one creative rule no one seems to remember. It is the first thing I ever learned in writing and cinematography. Show, don't tell. Yeah. Uh, don't you, tell me. Don't have the person go. Oh, yeah. I'm so angry. Make them punch a wall or something. Yeah, yeah. It's something. My because Claire is a English teacher. She's uh, and particularly when they come around to. Uh, part of the year where she's teaching poetry it's something she's constantly harping at them and she's you know telling it uh, you know even when she's at home marking it she will constantly say show don't tell show don't tell show don't tell so in that respect absolutely clever i sort of have an issue my issue is this and i agree it's sort of personal and i think it's partly cultural as well you guys talked about how much you love british comedy I have an aversion to British comedy. And I oh, get out. Now and let me let me okay, let me clarify. Let me clarify. Ninety eight percent of British comedy I think can just die in a yeah. dung okay. fire. All right. But okay. but 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 there are a few people. Yeah. He's one of them sure. who channel that two percent of the British comedy where I'm just like, you guys are the most effing brilliant people on the planet. Right. Okay. Because but only that I, little two percent. There was elements in this movie where I just sat there and I went and mm. Uh, I didn't think that was funny at all. And it sort of comes down to, I grew up watching a lot of, not a lot of, but uh, some British comedy and none of it appealed to me. Uh, I watched things like, Are You Being Served and On The Buses? Um, and I have to admit it, I actually don't think Monty Python is funny. Um, I don't either. Yeah, and... There's, so there's, I grew up oh, with this, come on. I, grew, <laughs> I grew up with this aversion and Benny Hill too. God, Benny. Oh my God. How you many see, times? Benny, Benny Hill no. Yeah. So my wife hated Monty Python until I explained to her that it is the closest we've ever gotten to having a comedy version of Dada. Probably. The Dada movement, yeah. and, and because I, they tried you know, it with the Space thing, Ghost, the they tried it with Space Ghost, and it was like, okay, yeah, it, it's it was too random. But there's just enough structure in Monty Python for you to go, this is random. Oh, this is random. And after I explained to her Dadaism and how that works, she was like, Monty Python's brilliant. Yeah, uh, no, I'm look, I'm on board with you there. I just the only one of their movies I've actually found funny is Holy Grail. 
I've tried to watch the other ones, and even parts of Holy Grail I don't like. And the the reason it's so random is they said they basically looked at comedy and said, "Can we tell a joke? Can we make someone laugh by never ever having a punchline?" It's like let's make a joke now. Remove the punchline. Where does the joke go? Can it be funny before the punchline? And it forced them to have to do random stuff, to go off the wall, to be like, oh, this parrot's dead. Well, I wanted it to be a lumberjack. What? Musical number. It's because like they completely deconstructed it and was like, let's just take out, never use a punchline. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I like what they did with Life of Brian. For some reason, that uh, that appeals to me. Just, I think it's more the concept of just a parallel life to Jesus Christ. I, I found that appealing. And I, it's sort of built up over time where if it's, I sort of cringe when I hear it's a British comedy and I sort of develop sort of connotations in my head without giving it a chance. And I, it probably happened once or twice watching Hot Fuzz. But yeah, oh, absolutely clever. Um no doubt about it. And I, as the movie went on, I found myself chuckling along with the gags and laughing out aloud. But certainly I was a little sort of hesitant to start off with. Yeah. Oh, see, I think the reason I love British humor so much is because, like, American comedy is standardized. Like... Terribly. Yeah. It, it's, oh. like, yeah. It, it's why I hated getting my degree Everything was so standardized and we would have, we would literally have um, like projects, like quick, they, uh, they were just called like one shots or something. It was like, go out in an afternoon, film, edit, and get ready to show tomorrow a like two minute uh, production about something. And it would be, it would be thematic. It would be like horror in the middle of the day. And I and you know my my whole uh, cr- you know team they were like how do you do scary stuff in the middle of the day, you know give me the camera let me show you you guys are wanting to do tripod shots of the house on campus that's supposed to be haunted let me show you what I can make that look like in midday we're doing black and white look at these camera angles I'm going to move it and I, I came up to my professor uh, I, I had to miss class when he saw it. And because I did totally non-traditional stuff, I was like, "Screw traditional! Like that stuff's not scary. You'll never scare somebody who just both point the camera at something and sitting there." And I said, "Hey, did you get to see um, our work?" And he goes, "That's the best project I've seen hmm. teaching." Because I was like, it, "Screw your standardized crap! You're trying to show a shot, reverse shot, and rule of threes." I'm like, "Watch me break those rules, and I can show you what cinematography can do." And so I always grew up watching British stuff because British stuff says, screw it. I watched The Young Ones, a comedy oh, yeah. show literally about anarchists. Yeah. Like, it'd be like, hey, what's for breakfast? And a dude would just set the sink on fire. That's the joke. <laughs> like, he, he would just dive out a window. Like, literally, one of the scenes is like the way the guy enters is he dives from the roof through the ceiling, lands at the table. He's like, all right, breakfast. It's like, what? Like, what? you could never get away with that stuff in America. No. I didn't like the young ones either, but I do will acknowledge <laughs> that the, there, there is certainly a lot more nonconformity in British comedy, British television, than you get in American television. I, I absolutely but, agree with you. I there. mean, there is a style of comedy that I absolutely hate. And it mostly revolves around Ricky Gervais. Like, he's the British comedy I hate. Right. Like, it's always... He only makes a joke to take advantage of people. Yeah. He, like, it's always, like, making fun of people. Like, um, it's always at someone else's expense. expense. He never yeah. does anything at his own expense. It's always vocal. It's just him saying some stupid dry line. Like, like I tried to watch The Office, the UK version... And there was like one scene where he's like, what is she retarded? And it's like the woman walked up and she actually had a physical disability. And it's like, oh, I mean, uh," and I'm like, that's not funny. 
Like, yeah, you can tell a joke like that, but you have to do it in a way that makes me laugh, not just like, haha, I'm rich, I get to make fun of people without consequences. Pretty much. Like, I hate I that agree. crap. Yeah, there, there, there is a, a mean meanness almost to his humor. Like Hugh, Hugh Laurie, he wasn't, a, you know, the, the best comedians do things at their own expense. Hugh Laurie dressing up in a powdered wig with like little puffy rosy cheeks and <laughs> like a little mole and stuff. Like making fun of himself as a bit yeah. of part of British Parliament or British royalty. That stuff's great. Yeah. Like that's why I'm like the young ones. They were literally destroying their bodies making that show. But yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, that's and Edgar Wright fits that mold. He says, screw the rules. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to use jump cuts. Freaking jump cuts, guys. I will not let it go. <laughs> no, jump no, cuts. But, but that's, it is why he's so great, though, because he, he doesn't follow the rules. I mean, like, I keep, I keep going back to that moment in Hot Fuzz where all of a sudden they just push a building on a guy and you watch it happen. And until that point, the movie had just not been this way. And yeah, that's then, when you and then that's there's a how you sudden tonal the shift. Yeah, there's a very sudden tonal shift that it doesn't deviate from at that point. And it's flawless. Yeah. <laughs> and in the same in that same, you know, around that same point in the movie where he's asking the manager of the supermarket, he's like asking questions. He's like, oh me? And he does that smile. And right beside his head is a picture of him doing the same exact smile. It's the same exact <laughs> shot, but in a picture behind him. Yeah. It's like, that's amazing. Edgar Wright, if you're hearing this, I love you. <laughs> I, I, think it's just, I think it's just a point that everybody else does so much stuff the same that anyone doing anything slightly different, it's like, this is brilliant. It, it is. I mean, I'm, I'm firmly in Camp Zack Snyder, for example, for similar reasons. I mean, the guy, the guy does things that people haven't done otherwise. You know, the slow motion and all that kind of stuff. He, he really pioneered a lot of that in, in the way that it's used now. I should say, you know, you look at like 300 and other movies, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, people that do things that are different really, really I gravitate towards. Edgar Wright definitely does things different. And, yeah, actually, you know, I should bring this up just because... I, I feel particularly bad about it. Um, but have you guys heard what uh, just happened with Zack Snyder? No. Okay. Um, oh, yes. So, with the oh, the epi- the so this episode League. is basically, yeah, this episode is basically over. So I'm just throwing this out there. It's kind of like, okay. a, you know, yeah, I'm, you know, I just, you know, heartfelt sympathies and all. Um, his, his daughter committed suicide. Um, so he's left production of Justice League to spend time with his family. Uh, Joss Whedon's jumping in to fill in the remaining post-production. He was already um, kind of like mildly associated with the project, but he's taking over now. And I just think that's really bad. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Zack Snyder's work, so that's it's sad for me. You know, I, I hope him well. I've actually seen him on the street in San Diego, so, you know. Not that he notices or anything. I'm just saying. I I hope the guy does well. Is, I'm a, like I'm a big fan, so that's just sad for me. Um, yeah, that freaking sucks. Yes, it does. It sucks a lot. Not for the movie, for him. Yeah, way to bring it down at the end of I the know. episode. There you go. Like you said, jerk. No, no. I'm a total jerk. Edgar Wright's amazing. Let's move on. Yeah, this has been the episode. Like, I it it, it kind of came in like a whirlwind. I'm like, this scene, this scene, this movie, so good. I love him. Blah, blah, blah. Like, uh, he's. It is the rare time you will see me go full fan fandom craze over someone because normally I'm like, it's a person they'll die, the sun will burn out, and no one will care. But then I'm like, Edgar Wright, he is the sun. Warm me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna get a restraining order on her. Maybe. So uh, yeah, what's next week? Next week. All right. Let's see. Uh, the idea came to me a couple of months ago. Um, we're going to, three heterosexual males are going to attempt to talk about musicals. I hate everything about you and what you stand for. <laughs> oh, you're the best. <laughs> Look, I, the, I, like I said, a couple, a couple of months ago, it sort of dawned on me just how influential musicals and how much I actually enjoy musicals 
and I can actually track it back way back when. So there'll be a lot of like way back when Vito was young stories and we'll look at sort of where musicals are at at the moment. So yes, we'll we'll see how long we could we can uh, our episode will go next week. All right, prepare to talk about Blues Brothers, Blues Brothers two thousand, Little Pet right. Shop of Horrors. Okay, like, I'm going all in. <laughs> okay. Wait, does this mean I have to watch La La Land? No, 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 no. I'll probably bring it up for all of three seconds, and that's it. How dare you bring up the travesty that is Blues Brothers 2000? It is a smirk <laughs> upon the beauty that is Blues Brothers. You can go to hell. So uh, bad. Uh, all right, musicals. Blues next Brothers week. is great. Oh, ne- I should say musicals next episode. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Push to talk wasn't working at all on Discord, so you didn't hear anything I just said. No, not at all. No, no, I was just sitting here waiting. I was, <laughs> I was, de- I was debating making a weird noise. I was talking to you, I asked V how he was doing, and he sighed. I was like, all right, <laughs> we're hitting it hard. <laughs> like, something doesn't seem right. <laughs> okay, uh, that's hilarious. Stop this recording and start again. Seems fun.